So would you please give a rousing afternoon welcome to our first speaker, uh, uh, sorry, we're Alison Stewart Allen. Oh dear, I blew it. Sorry, Alison, there you go. There you go. Thank yeah. you very much. Great, thank you. Gosh, what a friendly group. There's some audiences that are just the opposite. So I'm very delighted to be here today. And thank you very much for this invitation. Uh, so for the next 45 minutes or so, I'll uh, give you some ideas on differentiation and how you can drive your business uh, to be even more distinct. Uh, and then I will uh, delightedly take questions and the more uh, provocative they are, the better from my point of view. So please uh, make some notes on what uh, kinds of things uh, I might say that you hopefully disagree with because that's what makes this interesting. Okay, so a little about me. You've got some uh, background material. You will be shortly receiving these slides if you don't already have them. Um, you can hear from my accent, I'm not a Londoner, uh, and I'm originally from Southern California. I've been based in the UK for 28 years now and spend a lot of time interpreting how, uh, for companies of all kinds, all industries, how to grow successfully in an overseas market. And very often that means differentiation. How do we take what we do well at home and make sure that it's going to succeed in another market with the flavor of that other culture or region or geography? Uh, so I spend a lot of time doing that. I also wrote a book that uh, is called Working with Americans. So any of you that are working with Americans may be interested uh, to ask any questions on that and the impact of maybe uh, US uh, occupiers that you have. Uh, and how they may be different or what you might be able to want to do for them that, again, enhances your differentiation. Uh, so that's a little about me and my background. Um, I just thought I'd spend a moment now talking about uh, the agenda. Green button. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so a, a few key things, and um, for those of you that uh, have sat through many presentations, you probably know the rule of three, uh, because somehow we're wired to remember three things, and three is the magic number. It's a comfortable number, so I've got three agenda items. Uh, differentiation, what it is and what it isn't, just to make sure we're all on the same page about what we're talking about when we use this uh, jargon, often, in the marketing and business world, what exactly do we mean and what are some good examples and not so good examples. Next is what's this magic secret sauce for how to make sure that you create a difference and sustain that difference and I'll give you some ideas around that. Thirdly, how do you actually use that, those points of difference to build loyalty and advocacy so that your current or past uh, clients, occupiers, are out there selling you for you, which is really the goal of the game. Uh, and then, at last, your questions. So, next slide, please. There we go. Uh, Peter Drucker. Uh, I don't know how many of you know who he was, uh, but he was an eminent thinker and uh, just 25 years ahead of his time. And I was really lucky to actually have him as my professor when I was doing my MBA. Uh, at Claremont in Southern California. Uh, and Drucker is credited with saying that the customer never buys what the company thinks it sells him. And the reason I think that's a really interesting quote, especially in the business center industry that you're in, is because it's easy to make assumptions that what you think you're doing, uh, you're selling office space, you're selling a friendly service and reception, uh, you're selling some basic infrastructure, uh, access, software, laptops, uh, meeting spaces, etc. But actually, there may be something entirely different that you're selling that's a psychological benefit. It isn't just a hardware uh, answer. It may be something entirely different that is worth uncovering in terms of what is it that makes our clients excited? Why do they keep coming back or why do they refer us? What is it that is the need that we're satisfying beyond a physical space and that infrastructure? And there definitely are those needs that exist and the more you get behind them and uncover them, the more you can use that as your platform for creating points of difference. And I'll talk in a bit more detail uh, in just a minute about that, but how you get there is by asking the right questions so that you ultimately can find out 
what is that customer buying? So what are the intangibles that make our proposition different? Uh, and the more you can ask and survey and do your research to find that out, the better. So one of the things I know about your world is the extent uh, of disruption that is taking place currently. Uh, and no industry is immune. Uh, yours is particularly uh, interesting right now because of demographic changes, uh, because of heavy traffic on roads in city centers. Some of the things that are disrupting whether people will use uh, an office at all, rather than their living room or a Starbucks or some of the other venues that are uh, improvised as office spaces, is pretty interesting. Uh, but those are just some views of mine. I'm not in your sector uh, full time in the way that you are. So what I'd like to ask, a bit like maybe the, the hug, uh, is I'd like to have you turn to a colleague on your table. And for the next five minutes, and you may not uh, know the, the pe person next to you, that's actually fantastic, that helps me. Uh, but for the next five minutes only, I'd like you to have a conversation about what are the major disruptions for your business. Because two things is, uh, will come out, I expect. One is that you have a lot in common. Even though you may be competitors, it may be that you have exactly the same disruptions that are up, that's upending your uh, business or forcing it to change. Or you may learn that there's something entirely different for that colleague at the table, which might make you think, God, we're really not paying attention to that. Maybe we ought to be tracking it. So over to you, a quick five minutes. I will ding my glass when that's over, uh, and then I'll move on to the next topic. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much for uh, taking a couple of minutes to just compare notes with the people sitting uh, next to you. Um, I wouldn't mind just getting, having, again, the magic number three. I wouldn't mind just having three really quick ideas on what your conversation was. What were the disruptions that you talked about? So let's hear from three people. Yes, please. Uh, so, variety of different uh, operators on the table, and as also uh, suppliers to operators. So there's an element of uh, technical disruption. People, perhaps from the consumer side of the market, going coming sort of coming onto our turf. Mm -hmm. The right moves of this world, who sort of grew up in, you know, fl acting as estate agents and moving in and doing things like that. And at the same, at the other end of the scale, new operators coming in and doing things differently. Yeah. Everybody getting squeezed a bit. Yep, yep, great, good, thank you. Yep, so more people coming into the market who are the unlikely suspects. Yep, there's another one here, please. Um, related was the, the, the change of competitors from a competitor being a five-year lease to being a coffee shop often. And so you've got this massive, massive range of competitors with very different offerings and finding a space within that. Yeah, absolutely. So it's back to this point of difference. You know, how can you sustain that? What is the space you've chosen to play in? And then how do you exploit that commercially? Great. And then I think I saw a hand near the back, at the very back. <laughs> the expectations of young people coming into the marketplace, when they go to work now, what they expect in terms of technology is massively different to when people like me started. Absolutely. So completely changed expectations from a different segment of the market that you may or may not be ready for. So thank you very much. Those are great. Um, and they're all my uh, uh, understanding as well of where your industry is heading uh, and how you cope with those are some of the things that I want to continue talking about over the course of the next few minutes. So excellent. Thank you for that. Okay, so uh, let's get into the meat of the first uh, topic. Great. Uh, what differentiation is and is not? So um, assessing your competitor set. So this is the geeky uh, 
uh, strategy consultant in me coming out. I started my career in that business. Uh, and basically, what you're trying to do is decide what is the space we want to occupy and how are we going to make sure that we articulate our value in that space we choose to be in. And the reason for all of these pictures is because these are the places where people do their work, as you know better than I do. Uh, you know, it's the back of an Addison Lee uh, on the way to an airport or to a meeting. Uh, it's in the Hilton Lounge. I just I recently, going through Paddington Station, there's a Hilton there for any of you that have had the pleasure of uh, walking through as a shortcut to get a taxi on the other side of that hotel. Uh, you see everybody using that lobby purely for business meetings. I don't think there's anybody there drinking coffee that they bought at the Hilton. They're just there uh, having meetings. Obviously, the coffee shops, Starbucks and Pret and all of the Cafe Nero's and all the others are impromptu meeting places. Uh, and then, you know, it, it, the phone increasingly, uh, the airport lounges, and of course, your own sofa. So you are competing with all of those places where people are choosing to do their work, when in fact, you could make a case, and I no doubt are making the case, that this is not where good business gets done. This is not where clear thinking happens. This is not where uh, rich, high-touch, interpersonal exchanges are really going on. Uh, and that is fantastic for you as a source of difference because you're providing the venue and all of the other amenities that make these rich dialogues happen face to face rather than in a lot of virtual settings. I'm not knocking virtual because of course after me, uh, our expert from Microsoft I'm sure will be telling you uh, the fantastic benefits of virtual and how they can come pretty close to replicating face to face. But there's still nothing like being able to shake the hand, look in the eyes, smell the perfume or the aftershave and the coffee. You just can't get that through virtual ways of working. So, sounds a little old fashioned probably, but I'm not convinced uh, that you can really get there other than through some of the offerings that you, uh, you have. Okay, so what is and what isn't it? Just to kick that uh, conversation off, the middle ground uh, is, uh, is the death trap. So in other words, if you aren't clear that you're either offering a full service Rolls Royce proposition or you're offering the Ryanair uh, no frills proposition, that middle ground is being squeezed and it will continue to be squeezed because the points of difference aren't clear enough for most people that will use a business center. So the challenge that those of you who are in the middle have is finding the platforms for making yourself sufficiently different and moving up or down, or if you are in the middle, having something that is so unique and so hard to replicate by everybody else that it does make you stand out and that you can sustain those points of difference. That's the key thing. So I think the fact that you know life and work increasingly for those millennials uh, that you referenced in your short uh, disruption conversation, uh, that's blurring. And just the existence of we work, uh, for me, is fascinating. If I look at what they do, what they offer, the fact they're growing in this country uh, significantly, they have plans to grow across the EU and beyond. Uh, they uh, also now have a proposition called we live. So you, we, you can have the, your we work offering and vibe uh, at, during the day, and then you can have it at night when you move to their, ho their uh, apartments that increasingly they're looking at rolling out uh, also in Europe besides the US where they're from originally. So the thing that's interesting about that is that's an, a value proposition where they're threading through a promise at work and at home. And so the lines are blurring for the millennials and younger sort of under 30s who you know, don't really make that distinction between work and life so much. Um, so back to the space that you compete in uh, and you know, what makes you uh, be at your best, what are the assets that you have, both concrete, tangible assets and the soft assets, which could be your culture as a business, how can you use that to you know, improve and keep and attract customers and staff and all of these other uh, stakeholder groups that have an interest in seeing you succeed. So when I was thinking about this, about what differentiation is and isn't, I came across a great article in a magazine called Monocle, 
which is kind of a lifestyle trendy uh, magazine that some of you may uh, get and read. Um, and they had a really great article about the London black taxi. And that actually, um, the death of the black taxi can't come soon enough, according to this particular article and this writer, because the service is grumpy and the uh, driver isn't really focused on the c customer and the, the traveler in the back seat, et cetera. So they laid out a list of things that you could do to reinvent your experience. And actually, you're in the business also of offering an experience. You're offering a service. You aren't just offering a room and a physical space. It is a service. So if you were going to reinvent the taxi business, certainly in London, some of the ideas that uh, I read that I thought were just great and made me think, gosh, could you do that in the serviced office realm? And I think some of these things may resonate with you. So one was um, team up with local artists and designers. So you know you could imagine a Tom Ford or a Lulu Guinness uh, or maybe a Stella McCartney taxi where they take certain London cabs and deck them out with their fragrance, with their colors, with their textiles on the seats. Uh, so that would be a point of difference and, and certain consumers would say, Wow, I really, I'm going to wait for the Lulu Guinness taxi or the Tom Ford cab. Another might be that you get to play your own music through the docking system of the taxi. So, you know, sometimes, certainly for me, I have to suffer Radio 5 Live. No thanks. I'd rather hear other stuff. So wouldn't it be good if I could put in my own music? Uh, it wouldn't it be nice if I had fixed fares to certain destinations, Oxford Street, Gatwick, Heathrow, it, and other uh, destinations that are popular, and then I just know what it costs, and I don't have to hope that I have enough money, and I don't have to go to an ATM uh, or get a, a, a charge for using a card in the, uh, to pay for the fare. Uh, provide a real service, like talking to me. Uh, and giving me tips about London or London living or a new restaurant that they've dropped someone else off uh, to visit uh, when instead, you know, they're often on their mobile and they're yelling at their, their uh, girlfriend or their mum very often. I could do without that. Uh, put a cooler in the back. Sell me cold drinks or a beer if it's a hot summer day or mints or tissues or things that I just might find valuable, guidebooks because uh, they're in the travel business. So why wouldn't I want to buy a guidebook at the point of consumption? Makes a lot of sense. Maybe they should wear uniforms to professionalize how they look so that you know that there's some consistency across the drivers. Uh, details on every receipt of who that driver was so that if you leave your keys or your phone, as I'm sure some of us have done before, I certainly have, I know how to get them back because I know who that driver was. Uh, maybe they should learn some foreign phrases. Maybe they could help consistently with the luggage. So you can see on a service dimension, there's a whole lot you can do with a black taxi. Now, you could take some of those ideas and apply them to your space. What could that look like? You'll, you'll get the pleasure of deciding. Uh, going back to some of the things that you mentioned about people entering and encroaching into the business center arena, uh, from the unlikely uh, parts of industry. You know, you've got, as you may know already, uh, Barclays has Eagle Labs. So Barclays are trying to repurpose and make the most out of their leases when they're closing branches and turning those actually into office space, uh, like tech hubs, uh, for certain of their client base. Very smart idea. Leverage is a fixed asset. Why wouldn't you do that? But again, here's a bank, a retail bank, that's getting into the serviced office business. So what will that look like in the future? How will they leverage banking, if at all, and offer those services to that kind of customer? We'll see. Similarly, you've got apps. Headbox is one of them, as you all probably know, where you can book space uh, pretty spontaneously. Uh, and you have different suppliers who are putting uh, kind of like a hotel uh, booking system, a bit like Expedia, but for office space. So we have a meeting room in our company on the fifth floor. It's often empty. I might as well just you know, let it out, uh, assuming there's some uh, security behind the bookings, uh, and get a, you know, a, a 20, 30, 40 pounds for letting people use that space. So there's some really interesting innovations going on. 
in, the, in your arena where there's almost like a spot market for office space. So that will no doubt develop over time as well. So these are some truly differentiated brands, who, some of whom are in the office, or excuse me, in the service arena, and some are in the personal hygiene arena. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever been to Asia and Japan in particular, but there's a toilet manufacturer called Toto. And if none of you have had, or any of you have had the pleasure of using the Toto Lou, you'll know that you probably need a degree uh, of some kind to figure out which button to press. When will it blow dry? When will it squirt and clean? There's all sorts of interesting things that this particular toilet does, but it's truly differentiated. Now, who would have said we need to be different in the toilet industry? Nobody. As far as we know, everywhere we've probably traveled, a loo is a loo, and it looks the same pretty much everywhere, except when you encounter this particular toilet. So um, I trust you'll be able to Google this at some point uh, and see what I'm talking about in terms of all of the features that this particular toilet can perform and do. It's interesting. Um, all of these other brands, if you think about uh, um, uh, hospitality, uh, Hotel du Vin, Malmaison, Premier Inn, they're all super different. Um, they all have a clear positioning in your mind. They are all very different promises uh, in terms of not just price, but quality of fittings, service, uh, um, amenities, pools, not pools and spas, not spas. Uh, and so the point is that even in a crowded market like hotels, and you're not a million miles from the hotel industry in terms of the promise that you're making to a client, uh, then you can see that you go from, uh, you know, um, bare bones, no frills, to super high end and full every, every feature uh, offered for a five star experience. Disney is truly differentiated. Uh, whether it's the media, whether it's the theme parks, uh, whether it's the toys, uh, they all stand out. They all have a shared value set that regardless of where you consume Disney, you will have the same kind of values applied. So I guess really the point of showing you these brands is because in my view, as a marketer, these companies have done a really good job of carving out what's important to them, who do they serve, what does the customer think they're buying, and knowing that, and catering for that, and being able to sustain that. So it's about being better or different, and ideally the two at the same time. So carrying on with this theme of what it is and isn't, you know, Uber is really different from that London taxi uh, experience that I described. Uh, Etihad is really different from Ryanair, uh, and similarly, we work in Regis are different. Doesn't mean that there's a right and a wrong. So that's one of the tricky things, by the way, about this whole field of differentiation is, oh, we've got it wrong, how do we get it right? It isn't so much black and white. There are millions of shades of gray. And that means your challenge, uh, but the rewards that come with that challenge is finding the spaces that are relatively uncontested, finding the things that other people aren't doing, and do them. And ideally, do them profitably. Not even ideally, do them profitably. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> so here's just a really quick example. Um, on the left-hand side, I just did a screenshot of the WeWork website. Uh, just in uh, thinking through this topic before seeing you today. Um, that's the US site, obviously it's in US dollars, um, and they have different propositions. Again, you'll have a menu of different propositions, but the easier you can make it for the consumer, the better, the, the, the client in your case. Uh, and so they have different levels and different grades, just like you have in an airline, just like you have in a hotel, just like you'd have in any hospitality, or service industry. And the trick is to get it to be easy to buy. Uh, and so for me, as a point of difference, this is really compelling because within five minutes, not even that really, I can see what it is I'm possibly gonna get for my money. And I can quickly decide, oh yeah, that looks really good. Wow, a hot desk, $220 a month. Great, what cities? Oh, I'm gonna be in that city on this date for this meeting. Fantastic, done. So. It's fairly transactional, but it means that I get a sense about what this company is about. 
Uh, on the right-hand side is a little bit about the apartments proposition. Uh, there was an article recently talking about the We Live Apartments. They offer beer, they offer yoga, they offer events. Uh, it's almost like a singles club for millennials who are very attracted to this proposition. Doesn't work for me, but there is a market out there that loves this point of difference at home in a living environment. So it's just to show you what we mean by being different. The, the trick, as I say, is knowing what you can sustain as different, keep investing in it, and how you make it profitable. So how to be different? What's the secret sauce? So Coca-Cola is one of the best known, if not the best known brand in the world. Uh, they have protected the bottle design, it's patented, uh, and anybody that copies that shape of bottle uh, will get sued, they enforce it. Uh, and they know that this is a distinctive point of difference because of its high recognition. Even if you saw the shape alone, you would know that was Coca-Cola and not Pepsi and not own label, Tesco's own label, brown fizzy drink. You'll know it. So here's the secret recipe according to uh, my experience. Clearly define the customer problem you're solving. Now that sounds really straightforward. Sure, we know what the problem is, they need a space. No, they don't. They need convenience. They need friendship. They need help. They need a tour guide. They need a concierge to run their stuff down to the dry cleaner. That's what people maybe need, not just a space. Create a customer experience that is these four things. It's got to be consistent, so across all your locations, what you're promising in one has to run through all of them. Intentional, it's planned, you've thought about it. There's no accidental, oh, maybe we could do that, hmm, I'll think, of, I'll look into it. No, you have a fixed menu that you've thought about based on what the needs are of your consumer or your guest or your occupier. Different. Well, we've just been talking about some brands that are very clear in their position in the market that are profoundly different from each other, that have created the space. And then value adding. So something in the interaction with your business center or chain of business centers needs to add value to me. It's gotta be more than, like I say, just a space. Uh, processes and designs. Think about how you do your role. Think about how a client finds you and signs up and that journey and that experience. Is it easy? Is it complicated? Is it friendly? What's the tone? How does that all feel and work from their perspective? You can use that as a foundation for being different. Uh, study other services businesses. So it doesn't need to be in the hospitality realm. Could be legal, it could be property companies, it could be all sorts of other advisory firms. How do they do their business and how do they make a mark that's different from other people? Uh, let's see, innovation and listening. So it's about how the culture that you encourage and that you drive through your staff and through everyone in your enterprise. Investing in that ongoing learning, keeping people uh, up to date on some of the VUCA trends and disruptions that are on the horizon. Um, this next point is about uh, hiring for attitude, not aptitude. Uh, so in my experience and in the experience of many of my clients, if they hire for the person's outlook and mindset and willingness, then all that technical learning and technical stuff will come. But because you've hired for that willingness to help the occupier or the client, fantastic. It's easier to do that than to hire for the experience and then not have the attitude that go, you know, that's needed, really. Uh, and then invest in protecting what makes you different. Sustainable competitive advantage. Again, an, a, bit, a little more management consulting jargon, but what does that mean? It means that there's something in your DNA that's uniquely you. And if you're not sure what that is in your enterprise, you'd better find it and you'd better invest in developing it and keeping it and registering it. Back to the Coca-Cola example. What keeps them unique? It's not just the recipe, it's also the bottle and they know that's what their sources are of difference and they spend a lot of money in protecting it. So how do you build advocacy and loyalty? So really the trick is 
to have clients that are so delighted with what you're doing that they're out there recruiting for you. They're spreading the word. What does that look like? First thing to do is to understand the intersection of what matters to them, what's important to them, the attributes of your center or your location or your ideally bigger proposition, and how well you do against those things that are important. And what you're gonna uncover, I can guarantee you, is that you are spending time doing things that aren't at all important to them, but that you're really good at. And the goal is to move in the upper right-hand quadrant, where you are doing really well on the things that really count. And the stuff in the other boxes is nice to do in some situations and circumstances, but generally it's the top right-hand edge. What do they care about and how are we doing about those things? So it's back to Drucker's quote of, you know, the customer buying uh, what they think they're buying versus what you think you're selling them. And that reality check can be done by asking the question. And you can ask your tenants and occupiers the question at any point in that relationship. In fact, the richest source of intelligence are the occupiers that aren't with you anymore. They have tons of information about you, your competitors, and they will no doubt gladly tell you if asked. The second piece to the loyalty is this zone of affection. So the yellow square, which is in the top right, you only really get super uh, advocacy when you're hitting 4.5 out of five. That's 90 to 100 on satisfaction, which sounds like uh, an impossible task. It is not an impossible task. You've already got these people currently in your fold or have had in the past who are there advocating for you. So the trick is to understand what is it you really love about what we've been doing and how do we replicate that so that we get more people like you. So focusing on what's important, how you're doing, will get you to identifying that yellow square. So the second way you can make it happen besides this gauge of importance and performance know how you want to engage. So a lot of things you could do. First, start identifying clusters based on preferences. You can segment your occupiers in a number of different ways. Intensity of interaction with reception and other humans in the office. Uh, use of technology. Sophistication around other aspects of what you're offering and whether they take up these offers or not. But you can cluster people into groups. So that's the first thing to do. Second, articulate a promise for each of those clusters. But don't go too fine. Don't have a cluster of one, and don't have a cluster that's so big that you don't really understand what defines that cluster from a different cluster. Uh, next, communicate these with media that are relevant to them. So some people will digest information more by email, some by phone, some by Twitter. So as long as you know how these clusters are different and how you can reach them with your promise, that's the, that's the best thing. And finally, co-opt them in the process of development and research. You know, they're willing, they're on your doorstep, they're in your building. They're willing to tell you lots and lots of things. They just need to be asked in a regular way and in the right way. Finally, track your success. So what kinds of things uh, could you track? Uh, you could track referrals. Uh, you could uh, reward those referrals. Uh, you could create a net promoter score in your business. In other words, the difference between those that are advocating minus those that are defecting. Hopefully, that's a positive number in most of your, if not hopefully, all of your cases. But by tracking it, it means you're monitoring it and you're gauging who's advocating and rewarding them versus what you can do to correct the ones that are leaving and why some of your uh, clients may be leaving. Uh, find out where they go uh, and identify the cost for recruitment. So one of the things that could be really interesting is when you do that calculation, you may find that you can ideally narrow down which leads 
uh, and which uh, new occupiers and clients were referred from which uh, efforts of yours? Is it advertising? Is it the uh, hotel concierge down the road? Uh, is it a friend? And how much it costs you to recruit one of those new occupiers or tenants? Uh, and then, because you know that formula, you invest in those channels. So we're on to the final bit here, which is the Q&A. Uh, and I'm hoping that some of the things I've said today have sparked interest in you in wanting to rethink how have we made ourselves different, where are we investing to stay different, how can we use the service and the human factor as well as the hardware factor for that difference. Uh, and now it'd, it'd be great to uh, hear some of your thoughts uh, and feedback on the back of that. Alison, thank you very much indeed. Well, Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Some, some quite challenging thoughts for people there. Do we have any uh, agreements, disagreements, questions that you would like to ask? As usual, I've got dozens of the bloody things, but... Oh, you have. Somebody said something somewhere. Well done. <laughs> Thank you. Please. Hi. Thank you for that. Um, I was just interested to hear your thoughts on branded content and the idea that a lot of organizations now are trying to warm up their prospects by providing thought leadership and insight pieces about the spaces in which uh, they want to draw attention. Yeah. Um, and you know, the idea that once a prospect then gets in touch, you're really in the closing phase. You're not really trying to sell it at that point. They've done their desktop research, they've done their due diligence, and you know, they've got a good feel for it. They've started to make that emotional connection with the, the purchasing decision. I just wanted to get your thoughts on uh, brand content and uh, if that really is the watchword for 2016. Yeah. So um, branded content serves a great purpose for raising awareness. Um, and ideally driving um, purchase intent. In other words, um, putting you on their radar screens as one of the possible solutions for what they need. Uh, so the thing is, however, when it comes to a service, it's very often the case that they'll wanna try it first. They'll wanna see the tangibles. They'll wanna see the space. They'll wanna see the carpet. They wanna see the room. Are the walls clean? You know, there's basic almost hygiene factors, I think, that many occupiers or future tenants will want to check out before they make a commitment, and rightly so. The, uh, what the trick is knowing at what point uh, you move them from this is a good idea to actually getting in the car, or getting on the train or the bus or tube or wherever, whatever, bike, and getting to the location to physically see it. And so it seems that the more you have a regular communication with those people who have, who have looked at your site, so if you're doing your analytics and you're seeing where they bounce, bounce out uh, and wh what they did like and keeping in touch with them, that's great, that keeps it warm-ish, but actually there's nothing like getting people in face-to-face. -face. So it's the events, it's maybe an open house, it may be putting on an expert speaker or talk in your center to draw people in, including the people on that list of potentially interested prospects. Because then they're there, they're seeing other people, they're seeing the quality of your other occupiers. Because there's also synergistic effects going on here. Because you're promising a network to some extent, whether you realize it or not. You know, the, the, people, the other occupiers are a network for them. Uh, so that's also part of the promise, and it's very hard to do just by virtual media. Yeah. Did we, yes, Question please. here? Thanks. No, uh, first, thanks. This is more of a comment, but first I've got to say, man, what an all-star team you put together, Jennifer, for this presentation. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Um, I just wanted to underscore real quickly two things that you said, and so much jumped out at me, but um, one of the things that resonated, which I'd like to share also, is that the first five minutes that that client is with you and the last five minutes when they're leaving are the most valuable dynamic moments you'll ever spend, especially you're setting up a relationship in the beginning and when they're leaving, that person's walking out the door with so much valuable information 
they're a walking mega focus group. And a lot of us <laughs> lose that out the opportunity. Yeah. Be it they're leaving for good reasons or bad reasons, whatever reason they're leaving, they have so much experience, you can learn so much for it. It's such an opportunity. So I, I heard that in what you were saying, I just yeah. want to underscore that. Yeah, yeah, thank you, yeah, I agree. It's almost like an exit interview when you leave a company, when you leave your employer. I've, I'm, I've never really understood why companies don't really have a great process for understanding what could we have done to keep you here longer. Uh, hotels ask often, you know, with tick mark sheets in the room, uh, little suggestion cards you can drop in, but it's very hard to communicate high context things on a few lines on a suggestion sheet, really, so. Can I just build on that? Because yeah. that's one of the questions I wanted to ask. Um, it, it, fi finding out what people want in the future mm -hmm. so that you can build towards that is pretty critical to being disruptive. Yes. But as, as Steve Jobs said, it's no good asking people what they want in the future. They probably can't tell you, and yes. by the time you've done it, they'll want something else. If somebody had said to Henry Ford, what, or Henry Ford had asked customers, what do you want? They'd have said a faster horse. So clearly we can't ask people what they want. So what do you do to find out how people will respond positively right. to a disruptive thing for the future? So um, it's a really great question because it's a question about innovation mm. to some extent, which is that you probably already have some ideas of things that you'd like to do, but you're really, either you're not sure or, uh, you know, so one, one way to reality check your idea is to ask and test the idea. Um, if you ask for ideas from your occupier, you know, to this point, they can't articulate. Who would have ever said in a focus group, oh, I want a bagless vacuum cleaner? Nobody. It doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. But what it is, is a combination of your intuition, what you think is the right thing to do, where you think the market's moving. Uh, you hear things like Barclays using its branches as office space for, for um, customers. You know, so you're watching market movements, you know intuitively where things are going, you're hearing snippets of feedback from your occupiers, and what you just gotta do what you think's the right thing to do. What would you want? If you were an occupier, what would you wanna be offered? And very often that's where it starts. It's very personal. Uh, and if you look at some of the best uh, business success stories, they've often been driven by someone that wanted something that wasn't on the market, and they set it up for themselves and invented it themselves. So it's the same thing. If you were the occupier, what would you want that isn't already there? Uh, and try it. And you know, you can do low cost testing uh, and quickly iterate and learn from doing that testing. So I think you, it's a combination of pure market research in the academic sense, but it's also down to you and your feel for this market because you're mm. professionals, you've been in it for a long time, you know where the trends are going, so it's that confluence. Talking to quite a few innovative companies who are, with whom I work, that notion of experimentation, constantly experimenting, try it, guerrilla tactics effectively. Mm. Mm -hmm. If it works, build it, if it doesn't yeah. work, throw it out. It's, it's a very different business model, very different approach, but it works, doesn't it? It does work, and actually you'll stumble on something uh, through that process that you think, oh my God, this is mm. a hugely different, no one else is doing this. We better protect it, roll it out, give it a brand name, trademark it, register it, do something, and tell the world, look, only in our centers is this feature available. So you do test and learn uh, is really the best way to get, get to do that. Please, we got, it's whizzing its way to you. <laughs> I'm really interested in that innovation story, um, but some innovations like the bagless vacuum cleaner involve a significant amount of investment. I think Dyson did 2,500 prototypes in order to achieve that goal. Yeah. Um, and that's not something you just kind of do a little bit of experimentation and come across. So I'm just wondering what, if you've got any examples of organizations that have invested significantly and made a big gain through that process. Uh, through accidental, uh, through, through, through the through test and learn, a major investment in in some initiative has made an, a significant investment. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. So uh, they're not in your world, uh, this client, uh, but it's SAB Miller, uh, which is a big beer company, 
uh, and you'll Grosch, Peroni, um, amongst them, Miller Beer. Uh, and uh, they spent a lot of money looking at how you do flavored beers for females because women generally are not um, beer drinkers traditionally. Um, or if they are, the volumes are much less than men. And the purchase occasions of where women drink beer is really different from where men drink beer. And they want to bring more women into the beer market. So they spent a lot of money testing uh, a various flavored beers that are rolling out now uh, that will, I'm sure, prove really successful. And they were extremely methodical in the market research phases to learn what is it that we need to do to get women into the market. There have been female-only beers in the past. They've not at all been successful. Uh, but SAB Miller want to create something for men and women, but that's skewed towards women, and spent millions doing market research around the world to find what are some common things, because they are a global platform business. Uh, so what they do in one market ideally should become, if they can invest in it, a global brand that plays in every market. So that's one example. But yes, they spent a lot of money. Uh, and uh, you know, just because you spend a lot of money, though, doesn't guarantee success. <laughs> I mean, I, there are a lot of companies that have spent millions and have aren't with us anymore. So about how good you're listening is really what it's about. I'll give you another example of a company that spent millions on R&D. And it is, a, it is close to this sector. And it's the one I used to work with, which was Hilton. And we spent millions on this kind of experimentation, on forming innovation hubs and working with customers. But it, but it was dragged, kicking, and struggling to do it. And it comes to the, the final question I'd like to ask, which is um, the first step to get those millions was to convince a board of directors who were focused on being more efficient but not more innovative to face up to the reality that the market was moving away from us. And if you took the label off the door, you wouldn't know the difference between a Marius and a Hilton if you went inside. And that's the death knell for a brand. Mm. Do people really believe this stuff works? We've got financial people, we've got operators, we've got property people who don't have a background in customer experience and marketing sitting there going, yeah, that's fine, but. Yeah. So what can you say to convince people that actually, if you invest in this stuff, because it isn't easy and it isn't cheap, it works. It gives you an advantage. Yeah. You make more money. You become the John Lewis of this sector, yep. who are the most profitable retailer in the UK per square foot. Yep. But it's not by accident. So it isn't. How can you convince us that this is worth the journey? Uh, because you'll you need to get out more. In a nutshell. Okay. Could you expand on that? Yes. <laughs> Uh, you need to go talk to these customers and these occupiers and talk, find out why they chose you and not the competing center. What is it about your center beyond location? Because location is a huge driver, and I know that. But there's more than just the location. So what is it that was the compelling uh, or series of compelling things? And when you know that, you can use that to make money because that's, those are your sources of value add. Because what's a commodity is the physical space. What's not a commodity is everything else. And provided you know where value is determined in the eyes of uh, the occupier, then you know how you can manipulate that item. It's sort of uh, incremental utility. What's the incremental utility for me? How much more am I willing to pay to have a br faster broadband speed? Uh, and when you know how much more someone's prepared to pay for that, then you have an investment decision. Do we do it? Do we not do it? But until you understand the utility in the eyes of that uh, occupier of the various options that you offer at, by deconstructing the offer, only then can you reassemble those components into something that is more synergistic than if you just offer each one alone. So the trick is to unpack it, look at the, you know, the value in the eyes of that, your customer, your client, and then reassemble the offering in a different way, leave some stuff out. You don't have to do everything. In fact, you shouldn't do everything. You should be very focused and do some things that you're really good at and that make you money. So. 
That's I love what that I expression do. you just said, the, the commodity is the property, everything yeah. else isn't. But, That's right. But much of the time we focus on the property, mm. which is the commodity. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Alison Stewart. Pleasure. Alan, Thank well done. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you well so done. much. Well done.